but uh, Martin, Kim, thanks for joining us. Uh, looks like there may be some other other people who are clicking on the Zoom meeting links, so they might show up soon. <clears throat> we wanted to, uh, to alter the date of the meeting, uh, you know, hopefully having more folks to be able to show up, but um, it was kind of a only a week worth of a heads up again. Hey, Martha. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, running a little late, but I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll get uh, we'll get some amount of planning done. It, it's uh, you know this is always kind of a quiet meeting, and um, at the end of the year, but it's it's a good meeting to like exchange some ideas for like what went well, what could have been better, or kind of could have been done better. Um, you know, I think we've had some good success with uh, you know with changing up the meeting format. So um, there were uh, there was actually a, an NDSA planning meeting that happened this morning, um, or at least this morning here East Coast time, from nine to eleven. Uh, but uh, another idea kind of came up there with regard to the interest groups that we could chat about too. Uh, I kind of added it here as the last bullet uh, in the agenda, which was about themes across uh, meetings, um, across interest group meetings anyway. Um, oh yeah, thanks Robin for posting that. Yeah, I'm curious to hear more about the themes. Yeah, it's, um, we can, yeah, we can go ahead and get started by the after. Um, it was, and, and I had to, I had to jump off that call a little bit early, um, but had mentioned this idea. So, I, Last time, uh, not sure if you all recall, but we had talked about uh, the idea of having each interest group kind of take turns on a monthly basis to have their interest group meeting. So there would be, you know, the, the standards and practices group would go, that we would have a meeting one month, we would have a meeting the next month. Um, <clears throat> and then, you know, uh, we'd each end up rotating. So each each meeting would be uh, each interest group would be going once per quarter, essentially. Um, so in order to kind of introduce some cohesion across like the content interest group, our interest group and standards and practices, and uh, perhaps we could introduce a, a theme for the discussions for that quarter. So maybe an example would be, uh, say, it, maybe it's a project-based example where uh, what if you were um, tasked with updating the preservation related policies uh, that uh, surround like the preservation repository on your campus? What if you're tasked with setting up a new, like I remember last year when we had, or this past, what, maybe four months ago, we had a solutions room type um, uh, meeting where somebody had come with uh, the question of, okay, I'm setting up a new, uh, service or, you know, for our campus that is with regard to data sharing and research data management. Um, and maybe we could have a theme around that. What if you're setting up a new service for your campus uh, and one element of that service has to do with digital preservation, then, you know, what, what infrastructure is related to that? What practices or, or best practices are related to that? Um, you know, what kind of content uh, can you be expecting or, you know, kind of like focusing on for that particular type of service. So yeah, it's, it's more, of a, more of a way to kind of like tie together uh, three months worth of interest group conversations around a specific theme. But um, yeah, so uh, great, thanks, Martha, for posting that in the chat. So what are some ideas from CNI about next trend? Six, oh, interesting. Yeah. I'm just curious as to how that relates to what we do. Obviously, I'm new to this group, and I'm very, very interested in knowing what you guys see as the next things for our group next year. But I thought I'll share that one with you since we just had the uh, the uh, meeting um, earlier this month with yeah. CNN. Right, right, yeah. 
it's interesting, Martha, because I think the very first thing that you list their mainstreaming hybrid remote learning modes, you know, we could think about, you know, how the pandemic has changed teaching and how that impacts preservation. Yes. You know, are there different objects to preserve? How mm -hmm. does that change the infrastructure? Are there policies that need to be built around that? Mm -hmm. And I am also interested on AI for us, you know, like, does that even play a role? Um, I was a recent fellow for the IDEA Institute on Artificial Intelligence, but artificial intelligence in a way has to do with preservation. So, mm -hmm. so I wonder if, if there are any uh, uses. Right, what kind of, yeah, what kind of value could it add? Where, where could it be applied? The, yes. You know, that, um, that's come up uh, a couple of times. Um, I'm not sure if we discussed it in the interest group, but um, at least uh, across the campuses for UC, um, we had, uh, so, so I, I think you all may know Sybil Schaefer. She's uh, down at UC San Diego, um, but she and I talked about this a little bit. And, you know, what would it mean to uh, enable a machine learning algorithm or, or application to go through all the text-based content that was in, you know, uh, the the San Diego Chronopolis repository, the Merit repository, anybody's repository, really, and kind of um, extract different concepts uh, and information from all the different digital objects that are in there. Uh, and what what we kind of landed on was, you know, that perhaps might enable uh, at a high level for campuses to validate whether they're collecting um, policies that they have in place or actually make making an impact, right. um, you know, based on what, what you actually found in terms of the concepts and other information uh, that could be pulled out. So, yeah, yeah, that's, but I mean, gosh, who, who knows? Uh, there's it, like, for for us anyway, and maybe you all uh, can, you know, Martha, if you, you have also have some input, like for our repository, we don't handle sensitive information at all. Okay. And in fact, we have we have talked a little bit about setting up a completely different instance of our repository <laughs> software to handle it, which would be a huge, a huge amount of effort. Um, but uh, you know, with regard to providing some sort of curation for incoming content uh, that necessarily wouldn't necessarily need to be uh, all, you know, person-based effort, uh, you know, would it, like what services are out there that might be able to apply some sort of sensitive information scanning? Um, I know that AWS has one particular service that one of our product managers here has mentioned to me. I can't think of it offhand, but, um, uh, yeah, there's, you know, scanning for that, scanning for even viruses, not that you need artificial intelligence for that. Right. So, <laughs> yeah, it doesn't you know? work, right? <laughs> there. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, there's it's definitely, that's a really interesting conversation. What are the intersections there? Mm -hmm. um, so, but micro-credentials what did they say about micro-credentials that one is 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 a new one for me actually i had more questions uh on on that one that i mean my concentration was uh what robin mentioned before uh you know how do we preserve the content that has been created during the pandemic especially since it's ongoing is that so is some of that content reusable so that was the uh thing for me and then ai in a sense that and I'm sure you guys go through the same where, like for instance, here we serve 28,000 students, but it's really about 120 staffers at the libraries, including the satellites. So that tells you that automation for us has to be the way uh, because otherwise it gets crazy on how to do things. And there was a very neat presentation. Let me see if I can get it. it, it you got my attention when you mentioned uh, um, whether something was classified, hold on, uh, I can find it. 
Oh yeah. So at the CNI virtual conference, there was a gentleman that uh, he was more like an FBI agent. He wasn't really a librarian or an archivist, but his presentation mm -hmm. was implementing artificial intelligence technology at a major library. And the library was the National Security Research Center in Los Alamos. Talk about classified. Oh. <laughs> so anyway, I had a lot of questions for him because I wanted to know how they do it. I mean, their information is highly classified and right. how much information are we talking about? And since this is not going to be published, what are the security measures and how many people he has working for him? So it turns out that yes, this outfit is in the millions of dollars. Um, he claims that they had 14 million pieces of information. And then I said, okay, that sounds great, but how much of that is digitized, right? Because that's very impressive. I don't buy it because I know that preservation is very expensive. And uh, mm -hmm. he said that less than 10% was digitized and less than 10% of the digitized work has been cataloged, which you know, cataloging takes a long, long time. But anyway, um, they have 70 people working on this project at Los Alamos. And they mentioned a software that I need to research is called Palantir. P -A. Palantir. Yeah. So that's the one they started with. I don't know that that's the one they're using right now. But um, so anyway, um, I have his contact information, but I'm just curious to see how they're going to do all of that work because from either angle, you see it, you know, like from the digitizing, that's a lot of work. So it has to be automated. From the digital preservation standpoint, yes, we know that that is very expensive. I mean, what is it that you're going to use? How many servers? What size? I mean, I have a thousand mm -hmm. questions. And then cataloging. Uh, but anyway, uh, I, I'm just highly curious about how that will apply to an organization you know, finding the correlations between what he does and what we do, because I mean, I don't have 14 million of information or, or pieces to digitize, but it just seems like we don't have enough staff, but I'm sure that is across the board. Does that make any sense? Yeah, I mean, 70 people, 70 people like actually working on this project. Like, on one uh, project, isn't that? Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a... <laughs> Amazing, insane. those kinds insane. of resources, and and who knows what's doing, you know, who's, who's doing what, right? I mean, there's mm -hmm. probably multiple development teams, uh, multiple teams focused, or just teams focused on policy and the actual examining the con. I mean, cataloging, like you said, like everything's going to this huge amount of bandwidth that has to be applied yeah. to that to make anything happen, right? So, and you have to know, like in in my case, you know, like. There, yes, they probably have some massive scanners, but when you're on a classified mission, I mean, you have to have something to scan everything at a quick rate before you have to leave the place or you get thrown out of the country or whatever. So anyway, so it was very interesting. Yeah, yeah, imagine. Um, I think, yeah, I have not seen that kind of presentation before. Um, I'm trying, I'm trying to think of like uh, back at the last iPres that I attended, there was a really interesting um, kind of like application of machine learning to email archives. Um, that was, you know, and there was a, the probability of having some sen sensitive information in those two, but we're here, we're talking about like highly classified, like the whole document. thing, right? The entire document. Yeah, it's like the whole pipeline has to be like super, yeah, yeah, uh -huh. super secure. So, um, Wow. Okay, Palantir. I want to make sure I got that uh, spelled correctly. Is it P-A-L-A-N-T-E-E-R? Yeah, and I'll, hold on, I'll also post it uh, because there. Okay, okay, got it. Great, thanks. Yeah, it's like dissecting that kind of project would be pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. that, but the complexity of that also kind of reminds me of um, a talk I saw one time about um, a large, I guess this was at, was this at, it wasn't this past year's DigiPres, maybe it was the one before that, but there was a panel discussion about um, 
three different organizations that were applying for the new ISO certification for digital preservation repositories. I think it's uh, mm -hmm. ISO like 86186 or something like that. I can't remember exactly what the number is, but it was the, the sort of thing that um, was incredibly complex that they had to surface so much information about like their entire their entire program and uh, all the infrastructure and everything like that. And of course, you know, like an ISO certification costs $20,000, $25,000 on an annual basis, that sort of thing. You know, so it's no, no small price tag either, plus all the people's time that are involved in like trying to, you know, get to the point where they have their, the reporting available and, you know, the information that they can hand over. And of course, whatever type of application that you have to submit to ISO to, to make that happen, but I remember um, David Miner um, given a, a presentation, maybe as much as ten years ago at PASIC, about Chronopolis going through that and how expensive it was and how many dedicated FTE they had to have for the effort over a couple of years to actually get that. And I think most programs now, I don't know if they. I don't remember that panel exactly, although I think AP Trust might have been part of the panel. Um, but most people are taking the route of doing a lot of the work that is required, but not actually going through the certification, if that makes sense, just because of the cost. Yeah, yeah, right. So trying to get the benefit out of the process that way without actually formally mm -hmm. engaging with it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because overall, the money is limited for each of these, you know, large preservation consortia, and they're trying to manage it the best they can, be good stewards, and they weren't sure that, you know, actually going through the certification itself was worth how much it was going to cost the consortia. Right. But I don't know if thinking around that has changed. Yeah, two questions. I mean, yeah, the Chronopolis repository went through track certification, um, but I'm not sure exactly when, like you said, it was quite a while ago, right? So if you were talking about track or you were talking about? Yes. Yes. Okay. That was track. Okay. But was that based on the same standard, the ISO standard you were talking about? I, gee, I don't know how. Um, similar the two certifications are between ISO and TRAC? It's a good, good question. Um, but I know that they're, they're both super rigorous. So. Um, hmm. So with, with regard to this, uh, the CNI list, again, though, the, um, I wonder with, yeah, like professional development for hybrid teaching, hybrid learning places. It feels, it feels a little bit like a hybrid learning and teaching topics could, it, it, that, that actually might be a good theme to kind of like go across. Um, Oh, yeah, thanks, Martha. Uh, micro credentials for competency based recognition that allows an educator to demonstrate mastery in a particular area. Oh, interesting. Okay. Uh, Completely different than what I thought it was. Okay. Yeah. And for um, those, what I was thinking is like, um, I know a lot of people, well, several organizations try to do the entire preservation package, right? And we talk about uh, levels of preservation. So I wonder if there are specialties, you know, talking about as a micro credential, right? Because if you organize your inventory or your content in a way that you decide what level of preservation you're gonna apply to different content, depending on how rare, let's say, or how fragile. Uh, and then there could be areas on that could be automated. It could be a, a specialty. That's how I was taking it. You know, when when they were talking about micro credentials, you know, like you don't have to be an expert on an entire dis discipline, but if there is a small portion, I mean, it's highly specialized. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So, would, would that be 
something that would apply to uh, like a like library staff that would be you know specifically targeting I mean like their focus or their specialty would be within a certain type of collection or collecting area or something like that is that yeah okay? and you know like I can see and just to pick on one special collections and how different staff are experts at certain collections you know like in our case it will be the the Fulbright collection to or Florence mm -hmm. Price musician uh what is highly highly specialized and you find one if you're lucky two people who really know that subject right right yeah we, we actually have um uh, we've been working with uh, ucla recently on a uh, similar well, I, wouldn't, I don't know if it's a similar project but um the foundation that ucla is working with is a very specialized uh, foundation. Um, they have come up with a collection of uh, Mexican and Mexican American music from the 20th century that has tens of thousands of different sound recordings in it. And the the founder of the collection has been he just actually just turned 90 recently. Um, but he's you know there's an amazing amount of information uh, in addition to the sound recordings that revolves around this collection, uh, an amazing amount of metadata. And um, I mean, there's this foundation is basically, th those are the folks who are completely dedicated and have this, you know, highly specialized like background and, you know, clearly engagement with music in this genres or these genres. So um, yeah, it's just so neat to like find, like just discover what's there mm -hmm. um, and what they've been working on. But yeah, yeah, that's definitely like one of those if you don't have the specialty, then it just doesn't make sense. Um, so um, yeah, so so with regard to uh, like development um, or development for hybrid teaching or the hybrid learning spaces thing, I, I was just thinking like maybe that's one of those themes that could go across uh, multiple interest group discussions such that, you know, there are different staff again that are involved in different uh, areas of, um, you know, or of the curation process, of the collecting process, of the preservation process, and um, you know, how could we talk about what those, how those processes have changed, or what the experiences of those individuals, how they've changed uh, across the pandemic and since hybrid learning has been adopted. So. Um, that could be a really interesting like topic is sort of like way to wrap that topic around something that we might want to discuss. Um, so let's see, um, just kind of taking a look at, if we think back, like we're kind of shifting gears here. Um, if we think back to the beginning of this year, we had a we had a poll that was sent out to everybody in the group and we had kind of like you know added some initial topics to that discussion topics to that poll uh, so it's very tempting to go for a third year to kind of like uh you know say here here are some of the things we talked about already but uh you know what else do you want to talk about uh like to feel free for you know enable people to feel free to add things to that that poll um yeah, I can't Eric, see do you, any. Eric, do you think we might also um, augment that with a discussion of this, you know, once a quarter and themes that we could possibly mine from the topic list? Or would that be too much? Do we want to just simply ask for topics and then use it? Oh, you, you mean so just like for the, to ask people to consider the timing, like the quarterly, like just the pace of conversation or? Well, I thought if we talked about um, each of the interest groups taking one meeting per quarter, but mm -hmm. potentially having themes that ran across all of the group meetings for that quarter, that it might make people think about different topics. Oh, right. right. Yeah. Got it. But it could be simpler just to say, okay, here's the topic poll. But then as we look at the topics, think about them and how they could apply to the thing rather than making 
you know, complicating the poll. Yeah, yeah, that's a really, I mean, it would be, if we do take up this idea of themes, it would be great to be able to broadcast those and just have people maybe contribute ideas for what the themes might be and, and other dis discussions related to those. So we could kind of get a leg up on, on how we wanted to arrange the discussions across the interest groups. That would be really, really great. Um, I know we're supposed to meet uh, the NDSA um, coordinating committee is supposed to meet again on Thursday, uh, but with a different purpose, we're actually gonna be reviewing um, membership applications to the NDSA. But uh, yeah, since I was not in the very last, like the last half hour of this morning's meeting, I will ask to see what happened to the themes uh, idea. So, um, because, you know, we have to, for January, we're already, you know, within a month or a little over a month uh, away from our January meeting. So uh, it would be nice to have uh, a topic lined up for that. And, you know, to at least enable people to kind of like chime in on what they're interested in talking about. And if it has to do with a the theme, uh, you know, we could always also run with that if we wanted to, we could, we could, uh, even if themes don't get ad adopted across all the interest groups, we could always run with that idea ourselves. Um, and, you know, there hasn't been a final, there's not been a final decision made on the quarterly meeting versus monthly meeting. So I'm, I, I'm very keen to hear what that decision is very soon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so, uh, just to just to also cover one of the other um, agenda items, I'm I'm curious about what folks thought of the uh, the two other meeting types that we've had. One being the the meeting where we kind of in advance reviewed uh, a, a white paper or not a white paper, just a research paper, and a few videos on. DNA storage, uh, that was kind of like a, a reading club approach. Um, and then we also had the uh, approach of a solutions room where people could bring any particular topic up that they were a challenge that they were having at their institution. Um, do you all have any feedback on either of those meeting formats? Did you enjoy them or um, were there things that you might've done differently? I really liked the um, kind of the reading group kind of um, meeting, you know, mm -hmm. as an additional meeting. I mean, I like the variety of all, all of the different types of um, meetings that we had. The solutions, I'm trying to think. It seems like we had a solutions meeting. I can't remember the topic, but I think I did attend that one where different people, like somebody posed a question and then there was a discussion about how different people were solving that problem. Was that the format? Yeah, we, we had, um, I'm trying to think back. Um, I think one of them was just, was completely open and people could bring any kind of topic or challenge to the, to the table. Um, and the second one may have been similar, but then I remember, um, Oh gosh, uh, the person from, oh, it's, it was Ewan Cochran who brought the DNA storage topic <laughs> to our solutions room uh, ahead of one month ahead of our DNA so, uh, storage like plan okay. conversation. That's um, what I'm remembering. Yeah, yeah. And that was, that was really fun. That was great. Yeah. Um, kind of a good primer for, uh, for the following month. Um, I like that. I'm not sure how it would play if we're only meeting once a quarter, although it could. It just depends on, you know, are we going to do themes? Um, right. Um, I'll say for my part, um, the reading meeting, I really enjoyed that too. Um, I don't think it's something, especially if we are still going to meet monthly, I don't think I'd want to do it for every meeting. 
right. just because of the level of of prep. But um, I definitely feel like I got more out of that discussion because we did have like the preparation. Um, I also really enjoyed the solution room. And I kind of wonder if that would also be improved by kind of, I don't know, people asking questions in advance and so that we can kind of think on it and then bring the solutions as opposed to like trying to do it spontaneously. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the BitCurator users forum, they have a session they did called Great Question where people could submit questions um, like anonymously if they wanted to. And then, so they were up on like, I want to say it was Airtable or something. And so people could submit like written answers, but then they also went through in a, a conference session and talked about them live. Um, and that was like super helpful. So I wonder if that might be um, an alternative to do it kind of like spontaneously. But in general, I liked having different types of meetings you know, having some presentations and some more like participatory things. Right, right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, th I think it'd be, yeah, very valuable if, um, if people could submit their like topics or, um, you know, challenges like ahead of time for the solutions room, um, because that would, you know, also allow other folks to kind of think about those problems and maybe enable them to, um, you know, contribute some input on uh, with a similar experience or whatnot. Yeah, because so, I feel like uh, half of my answers would be like, oh, I know I've read about this somewhere and I have it in my bookmarks <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> um, but even just something right. like, you know, using the listserv or whatever to circulate even, those questions early. Even just verifying with a colleague you know, that I have my thoughts lined up the right way because right. it's been a while. <laughs> right. Or somebody else does the specific piece of... Exactly. That would be relevant. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm, I'm adding some notes here. Um, please feel free to augment them as, as you would like. I'm... I'm in general, a terrible note taker while also trying to coordinate a meeting. Um, I'm terrible when see. I'm not coordinating a meeting. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you know, it's actually, it's, it's nice to have a, um, it's nice to kind of have a small group this time because we, it's easier to just kind of chat, um, feel kind of like it's, it's more low key. Um, We're just deciding the fate of the whole interest group, just the five of us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Martin, did you have things you wanted to express about this? I'm sorry, did you repeat that? Do you have anything that you'd like to contribute about this uh, in terms of, you know, what you thought about the format of the meetings last year and how you um, think you might be able to improve it? That's a good question. I, I actually like the the ones like the prep one where you read and then have an idea of what the topic would be beforehand. I like that one. Um, I don't have anything right now off the top of my head in terms of ways to improve it. Do you like the idea of the themed and having the meetings once a quarter? Perhaps, yes. Uh, with that, with that understanding that there might be some loss of our sort of our own interest groups momentum, of course, but um, that of course that's a compromise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we might have to get creative about how we maintain that momentum. That's a good point. Yeah, yeah, definitely. 
So there was, there was um, specifically with, with regard to that concern, because I've expressed that to, uh, there's been um, talk and I think it hopefully will uh, come to fruition uh, to, to enable um, CanDSA to provide uh, Slack channels for people to uh, regularly communicate if they would like to, uh, but also possibly as a way to um, maintain any sort of momentum uh, within a given topic uh, across that three month time frame. So if we, you know, if we do start off with a very interesting topic uh, for the inf on the infrastructure group, uh, but then we won't have the possibly we won't have the opportunity to talk again for the next two months, uh, then we would have a different forum or a built like way to communicate with each other. Um, that's my hesitancy also. And that's kind of also, you know, an, another reason to have these uh, themes tying us together because they, they might help um, counter any loss of momentum. Um, I mean, it depends on yeah. people's like individual roles, but I think I would just start going to the other interest group meetings if that was the case. Mm -hmm. um, but I think a Slack channel sounds um, like a good idea as well. Um, we had one, the Texas Digital Library has one for the librarians that they work with in Texas. And even though I'm no longer there, I'm still on their Slack. Like it's a good place to kind of drop in and ask for professional like advice and insights. So yeah, it, it right, feels right. a little less formal than like the listserv. Definitely. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to catch up. Oh no, I was done. Since we've um added Slack into our communication tool suite at the library. Communication has gone way up. I mean, if people need to ask a quick question, you know, they'll post it there. And it just seems like we're all better connected than we were before. So I love the idea of having the Slack as an additional tool. Then let's see, hang on a second. Um, Arthur, you had mentioned what about case studies with context provided? Yeah, that was when we were talking earlier about um, your solving sessions or solutions. Um, I wasn't part of them, so I was trying to grasp the, the content because I joined this group like way after that. But um, so from the business background, I was thinking, what about if we could have, when we're thinking about solutions, a case study that somebody or two, it could be zero, that people want to resolve, but to have the background, the context as, as to how they got there, right? And then maybe everybody providing solutions. Is it still the solutions concept, I think, but I'm reaching because I wasn't part of, the, of those sessions at the time. Right, and there, I mean, there, there are published case studies. There are, you know, we could that we could examine. There, there may be ongoing case studies that somebody is interested in talking about uh, that they could provide some context for. Yeah, yeah, it seems like a, a very good idea. Uh, I just added that um, to our notes. I mean, that's a little bit like when we met earlier in the year uh, with the topic of um, uh, OCFL, the Oxford Common File Layout. Uh, we had Andrew Woods, who was part of that project uh, and creating, creating the specification and also implementing it 
uh, in which was it, was it Archive Matica or was it something else? Um, no, it was something else. Uh, but he, well, you know, Fedora? yeah, it was Fedora. Thank you. Yeah. 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 And Fedora like version six or something. Um, so it was interesting to hear his take because he was talking about the, the specification, but he was also um, in different ways kind of giving us information on the ongoing trials and tribulations that they were having uh, with OCFL in terms of its adoption, its implementation, and so on and so forth. So um, that was kind of a, a I guess you could call that almost like a, an ongoing case study of adoption for a new standard. So that was neat. Uh, it would it definitely helped with having him there volunteering to talk about it. So it'd be, you know, um, beneficial to have that kind of situation crop up again or see if somebody had a similar thing they could talk about um, being that involved in it. So, okay, well, let's see. Any frequency? Um, okay. Um, how, how are folks feeling right now? Do you want to uh, want to keep going? Any any other ideas to share? Or we've got a, a lot of good notes here. Um, you know, a lot for Robin and I to to work on or work with. So, uh, Robin, are you, you thinking about anything else? Or no. This looks pretty good. I think uh, we will be able to have some more discussion about things as soon as we have a decision made about the meeting frequency. Yeah, yeah, I, I will. Uh, I'll hopefully hear more about that on Thursday. Um, Robin, I think we need to make sure that uh, that Nathan Tallman, who will be the new uh, uh, the new chair uh, invites you to all the all the right things, or we can get you onboarded. I know that's something we need to work on over the next few weeks. I didn't so, know whether to ask that in this meeting or not, but I thought I should probably get on board so that this year I can. You know. Yeah, yeah. Leah, Leah spent uh, some time onboarding me last year, um, and she sent me a bunch of doc different documents that the NDSA has up there. Uh, and there are still some things that I need to um, get permissions to and also because Leah has been doing things like uploading these videos uh, mm -hmm. to our YouTube channel. Um, so I know I'm missing one set of permissions for that, I believe. But yeah, let's get that figured out. And as soon as we know more uh, about the quarterly versus monthly meeting, definitely let's, let's send them a broadcast out to the group for that. Also, what is the timing for the poll? The time, that's, hmm. We could, I was thinking that we could set that up at the beginning of January, at least like establish the, you know, because it, the same platform, we could use that. I think it was called tricider.com, uh, or we could find a different polling um, freebie site for that. Um, the nice thing about Tricider is it actually allows you to uh, establish a time frame for when people can contribute to the poll. So it kind of gives them a sense of, okay, you've got three weeks left or two weeks left to contribute ideas. And it doesn't just kind of like leave it out there. So, uh, Plus yeah, we could. People are we could, used to using that already. It'd be nice if they didn't have to learn how to use something different. Not that yeah. they can't figure it out. But. And it's. It's also one of those things where you don't need uh, an account to use. And I think, and like, yeah, people are, people who have added topics to it before, it's, uh, I think are probably comfortable with it and it's very easy to use. So you can stick with that. Uh, I assume it's still around. So I will check. <laughs> um, I know there were some positives to the LF change in the technology for the conference this year, but I found when every other conference I'm 
attending has a sketch as the thing that's managing. And then we switched to something different. I mean, maybe they're just trendsetters, but <laughs> it was not as easy yeah. to use the first time out of the bat, I guess. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, oh gosh, what is um, right? This like this past Digital Press conference, they used the new platform. Uh, that was interesting. Um, and then, but then, another like planning application that usually comes up is Shed, like S H S C H E D. It's like a schedule that's, that's Shed application. Yeah, that's that what pretty... I was referring to. That's yeah. used for almost every other conference. Um, right, right. So, okay, yeah, sorry, I didn't hear you earlier. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, technology is always changing. I may just be getting grumpy after 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like hybrid, hybrid conferences are just, you know, I think they've, yeah, it's like, a, I don't know how you all feel about it, but, but, some of them have been have been good. Some of them have been oh my gosh! I felt bad for the people, you know, how much effort they had to go through, and yet still, you know, the whole process didn't kind of come across as. But that was pretty much earlier during the pandemic, at least with my experience. I don't know. Yeah. So things, things have, have kind of smoothed out. Pretty good. Yeah. You know, I like being able to have recordings of things to refer to and being able to have access to more at the same time the job pulls so much on you getting scheduled time to actually dive into those is hard but right right yeah i um i'm curious so do you think martha do you think the cni like recordings are gonna are they available somewhere or yes yes they, oh, they are, are okay um yeah, they're, they're actually very good at that. And I have, I have always appreciated that, but I have the same problem that Robin just stated, you know, like trying to get back, right? Uh, let me see if I find it out. And I actually verified with Cliff Lynch that it was okay to share those with, you know, people throughout the library and he was very supportive. Yes. Mm. I think that especially during the pandemic, knowing that it's so hard for everybody to attend conferences, they're, they're being very nice about it. Right. There right, was yeah. another discussion thread today about how, because a lot of people are at the in-person CNI, and I'm on a channel right now where people are discussing some of the stuff that's coming up. And mm -hmm. one of the things is it's about you know, online versus in person or yes. hybrid, and talking about the number of people that have actually been marginalized or haven't had the funds to be able to attend. And the online meetings kind of open that up. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, most everything is recorded and they have uh, future and past meetings. Um, for the virtual platform, the, what I understand is that the recordings were just made available and it's pretty much like an on-demand platform where you just go in and watch at your own leisure. Yeah. We did one of those because ours was a project update and wasn't you know, really prioritize for the virtual live mm -hmm. thing. So at the beginning of CNI, you know how they listed that whole list of things. Yes. We had all pre-recorded our presentations. But then, you know, there must have been 20 different projects. And it's like going back and mining through all those. It's going to take time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, well, so <clears throat> let's see. I, um, yeah, Robin, I don't know how you feel. I'm feeling pretty good. I think we mm -hmm. could, uh, yeah. This is, yeah, this has been good. Um, thanks everyone for contributing. And I kind of like 
small town meeting here. Yes, so, happy um, holidays. <laughs> yeah, yeah, happy, happy holidays. holidays. Yeah. So it's good to see everyone, and uh, we hope to uh, see you in January. <laughs>